Hello, my name is Gemma and today I'll be talking to you about human nutrition and the digestive system. During this presentation I'll give an explanation on the structures and functions of the digestive system, the process of mechanical and chemical digestion and the enzymes that are involved, and an insight into the constituent food groups of the balanced diet. So digestion begins in the mouth where food is broken down by the teeth through chewing. This is a process known as me mechanical digestion. In our mouth we have three salivary glands, the sublingual, submandibular and parotid. Uh, these produce a solution consisting of water, mineral salts and the enzyme ptyalin, which initiates the digestion of starchy foods. The solution, uh, known as saliva, then mixes with the food. This is a process called mastication. The food is then rolled into a bolus with our tongue and passed down to the pharynx, where the process of swallowing then becomes involuntary. The muscular wall of the pharynx constricts and pushes the bolus over the epiglottis and into the esophagus. The esophagus is a hollow muscular tube measuring at approximately 25 centimetres long and extends from the pharynx through the diaphragm and into the stomach. It has an elastic fibrous covering and pushes the food down into the stomach through peristaltic contractions. The liver is an accessory organ, meaning the food does not directly pass through as part of digestion, but it does aid in the digestive process. The liver is responsible for producing bile. Bile is a yellowish green fluid composed of water, salts, cholesterol and the pigment bilirubin. It leaves the liver via bile ducts and is transported and stored in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is a pear-shaped accessory organ attached to the liver, with its main function being to store bile to later to be used to aid in the digestion of fats. The stomach is a hollow muscular organ consisting of three layers of muscle. It aids in mechanical digestion as the muscular walls of the stomach churn the food. Chemical digestion also occurs as the food mixes with gastric juices, which are produced by the stomach glands. These gastric juices consist of water, hydrochloric acid, mineral salts, gastric enzymes and intrinsic factors. The pH level of the stomach can vary between 1.5 and 3.5, making it an acidic environment. Once churned, the bolus will now be more fluid in consistency and is known as chyme. Chyme is passed through to the small intestine by the pylorus sphincter, and this is where the majority of digestion absorption of micronutrients occur. The small intestine is roughly 6 to 7 metres in length and is divided into three sections, the uh, duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum. At the same time chyme enters the duodenum, the gallbladder secretes bile through the bile duct and the pancreas secretes digestive enzymes such as amylase, lipase and trypsin through the pancreatic duct into the duodenum. In the jejunum, absorption of amino acids, fatty acids, glycerol and monosaccharides occur. The ileum has a very large surface area and is responsible for absorbing vitamin B12 and bile salts and enzyme molecules. The micronutrients left are absorbed through the cell lining of the small intestine and into the bloodstream. Along the lining of the small intestine are bili, crypts and a thin mucus layer. Uh, bili aid the absorption of nutrients as they help to increase the surface area of the small intestine. The large air intestine is far shorter at approximately 1.5 metres long but is significantly thicker. The large intestine plays a vital role in the absorption of vitamins, conversion of undigestible food into faeces and removal of water from faeces. Food substances that have not been digested in the small intestine can undergo a fermentation uh, within the large intestine due to billions of bacteria that are found there. Uh, the lining of the large intestine also contains crypts but does not have bile. The mucus layer is also much thicker with a thinner mucus layer on top. It is made up of four sections consisting of the ascending colon. This runs upwards uh, toward, uh, through the abdominal cavity and begins the process of absorbing nutrients and removal of water. The transverse colon, this is the longest most movable part of the colon. The descending colon, where feces are stored ready to be emptied by the rectum. And the sigmoid, the muscular walls of the colon contract here and increase pressure, which causes salt to move into the rectum, ready to be excreted through the anus. The anal canal is the final stage of the digestive system, where the body excretes waste materials in the form of stool. So, mechanical digestion plays a vital role in the process of digestion, starting in the mouth, where teeth break down food into more digestible pieces through mastication. Mechanical digestion can also be witnessed through peristalsis in the esophagus, small intestine, large intestine, and through maceration in the stomach, where the bolus is continuously churned uh, using the muscular wall of the stomach. Chemical digestion also begins in the mouth, where the brain triggers the production of saliva and enzymes, such as salivary amylase, which are then secreted through the salivary glands. Enzymes during chemical digestion are vital for the breakdown of macronutrients into micronutrients for the body to be able to absorb vitamins and minerals from the food that we consume. Chemical digestion occurs in the mouth, stomach, small intestine and large intestine. So just a few examples uh, of some enzymes. As you can see here we have pepsin. This is secreted from the gastric glands and works by breaking down peptides into smaller protein molecules called amino acids and has an optimal range of between 1.5 to 1.6. 
Uh, here we have amylase. This can be uh, secreted from either the salivary glands or the pancreas. Salivary amylase targets complex sugars or starch to break down into glucose molecules and has an optimal pH range of 6.7 and 7. Pancreatic amylase breaks down complex sugars into simpler sugars, such as starch to maltose. Um, pancreatic amylase also has a wider pH range of 5 to 10.5, but works best at 7. Finally, we have lactase. This enzyme has a pH range of 2 to 7. It has an optimal pH level of 6. Uh, this is secreted by the lining of the small intestine and works by breaking down lactose into glucose and galactose. So, uh, as shown on this chart here, we can see the types of food in the constituent food groups. They're separated into five different groups in accordance with the Government Eat Well Guide. Um, the government recommendation for children over the age of five and adults is that we uh, should be consuming 50 to 60 percent carbohydrates, 15 to 20 percent protein and 25 to 30 percent fat. So just a closer look at each of the groups. So in the group one, we have essentially our proteins. Uh, this could be in the form of meat, poultry, fish, eggs, nuts, beans and pulses. Food items in this group provide a rich source of protein, essential for many functions within the body, such as growth, repair, maintenance, metabolism and muscle development. Uh, protein makes up a major part of every living cell and can provide energy where carbohydrates and fats are not readily available. Uh, foods in groups 1, such as beans and pulses, can also provide a good source of dietary fibre which aids in digestion and reducing blood cholesterol. So in group 2 we have carbohydrates. This group can consist of bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, uh, breakfast cereals. Whole grain versions are typically the healthier option to choose from as they not only provide a better quantity of vitamins, minerals and dietary fibre but also support a slower release of energy. Um, refined carbohydrates have an adverse effect on insulin response so they're usually more processed containing little to no vitamins and a high amount of sugar. Foods in this group are very important as they provide a vital source of energy. They should make up roughly a third of our daily diet and should be included at every meal. Carbohydrates are also macronutrients that are broken down into glucose, absorbed into the bloodstream and then either used or stored as glycogen. Uh, starchy foods help to fuel working muscles, increase concentration, stamina, skill, strength and energy. Indigestible fibre found in starchy foods can also help to aid bowel function and prevent gastrointestinal illness. So in group 3 we have fruits and vegetables and um, that can include leafy green vegetables, bell peppers, tomatoes, carrots, apples, bananas, blueberries and oranges. Uh, it's recommended that we have at least five portions of fruits and vegetables and um, for that to come as a variety of these options um, as they all vary in macro and macronutrient content. Um, they're also naturally low in calories and have a higher rate to content. Um, antioxidants are also present in a lot of foods within this group. They are substances that can counteract damage to the cells from our bodies caused by physiological processes. Um, foods in this group also provide a great source of dietary fibre. Um, soluble fibre is partly digested and believed to aid in the reduction of cholesterol in the blood as it binds with fats in the digestive system. And examples of that can be oats, barley, broccoli and apples. Insoluble fibre is not digested, instead it aids in digestion and elimination of waste products for the gut. It also facilitates the growth of important bacteria in the gut. Insoluble fibre can help with the prevention of constipation and development of colon cancer. And examples of that can include wheat bran, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. In group four, we have dairy and alternatives. Examples can include milk, cheese, yogurt and dairy free alternatives such as soy products. Low fat options are usually the um, better ones to choose from as they can reduce the amount of saturated fat intake. Foods in this group can provide an excellent source of calcium which is essential for healthy bones, teeth, muscle contraction. Um, they pro provide a good source of protein, vitamins and minerals and it's advised that we should all consume foods in this group roughly two to three times a day. Finally, in group five, we have oils and spreads, which are our fats. Um, they are an essential part of a healthy, balanced diet and should account for 25 to 30% of our daily intake. The key functions of fats in our body include the formulation of cell membranes and assist, uh, assist in regulation of enzymes. Fats are a vital source of energy and all excess calories are consumed as stored as fat in the adipose tissues, um, as this is the most energy dense macronutrient. Fats are separated into two groups, they're unsaturated uh, fats here, and they are beneficial to health, thus being the uh, healthier option to choose from, and they should make up roughly 20% of our total fat intake. Unsaturated fats can be found in olive oil, sunflower oil, canola oil, nuts, seeds, and some fish, which will also provide a good source of omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. Uh, saturated fats should make up less than 10% of our daily intake and are predominantly found in animal sources, such as fatty cuts of meat, butter, lard, and cream. Uh, despite negative assumptions, saturated fats are still required in the diet as they are important for the immune system, provision of energy, enhancement of liver function when toxins are present and are vital for the structural makeup of cells. Foods in this group may also include cakes, sweets, pastries and fast food. 
These items are high in trans fats, well as refined sugars and sodium, which is detrimental to our health, so should be consumed in moderation. So that concludes my presentation for today. I hope you have enjoyed it and can come away with a better insight into the human digestive and what constitutes a healthy, balanced diet. Thank you.